Fantastic. Good evening, Tammy. Good evening, Dr. Rob. Happy Valentine's, post Valentine's Day. Exactly. And happy President's Day today. So it's kind of a holiday weekend. So, yeah. So, well, I was working in our treatment center seeing clients today, but uh, it, you know, those Monday holidays a lot of people get, us therapists we generally don't, but that's okay. Correct. Because I, I tell you, I learned so much from working today at the, with the clients. It was just such a gift to me. So, anyway, we're here to answer questions. I know that's the case. What do you got? We do. The first question is um, My husband and I had our disclosure two weeks ago. There was no diagnosis prior to the disclosure, and I don't know if there was any talk of recovery or if he was sober for 90 days. So many things seem to go wrong in the process. The worst part is the next day he told me he didn't see how me knowing all these things could possibly help us and that now I would be more suspicious. He said he doesn't see any way I will ever get over everything he has done. He said the disclosure will cause more doubt, suspicion, and problems and that he was lonely and didn't see any other way to get past that in a way that we could be happy and he can get what, uh, what he needs. The disclosure itself did not contain anything shocking and it mostly included things I already knew, which leads me to believe it wasn't complete. I did not see this coming. In the meeting, he said he loved me and was committed to making this marriage work. He's in denial and doesn't admit he has an addiction. Uh, apparently, there's a part two. During the disclosure, his lifetime of masturbation was addressed and he was very defensive. My guess is his denial, shame, and need to hang on to his masturbation was way too much for him and he'd rather end the marriage than give that up. I wasn't angry after the disclosure, though I did need time to myself to process. I didn't give him any indication that I wanted our marriage to end. I think he was looking for reassurance, but I hadn't even had 12 hours to process and I needed this and I needed his reassurance. All I said was thank you for your honesty and I respect your decision. Prior to that, I made it known that I would stick by him if he admitted he had an addiction. Since then, we've had coexisting very peacefully in the same house. He stopped showing physical affection and doesn't say, I love you anymore. I'm practicing self-care and trying not to hold on to hope that he will admit he has a problem. He's still wearing his wedding ring and doing things he's promised to do around the house, but never has. Okay, there's a part three, So, the, but then it seems like this is it. I'm sure there's a question in here yes, somewhere. Yes, I'm trying to get there. I, I should have pre-read, sorry. He wants to stay active in couples ministry where we volunteer and has not brought up our divorce or separation. When I say we should tell people we are divorcing, he says nothing other than going to work. He's home all the time, numbing out on the couch to TV. We are having some nice conversations and I think he's slowly moving towards me again. My guess is I called his bluff and now he doesn't know what to do. I love him and accept that this is an addiction has nothing to do with me. Good. I want to save this marriage and would support him through the difficult recovery process. But if he won't admit he has a problem, then there isn't much I can do. I know you can't force someone to admit they have an addiction. They have to want recovery for it to work. We should talk. Um, have you ever seen the addict want to end the marriage after a disclosure? What do you recommend moving forward? He has agreed to go through with the impact statement and write the restitution letter. It's very confusing. That is a lot. And it's very, well, I can understand it why it's sounds like you had an immediate response, Tammy. So what were you, did you want to say? Well, it, like in that one spot, you know, because I get this all the time is like recovery won't work if you don't, you know, if you don't want it. And I think of how many people have come into seeking integrity and have been minimizing, haven't really thought they had a problem. And by the time they leave, they have a far better understanding of what's really going on and are able to accept responsibility, have dealt with some of the shame, et cetera. So, so you know, I've always been um, in the, you don't have to completely be a believer before you get, you know, get to start the work. Thoughts? I get that. Um, well, first of all, I, I just really start out. Uh, um, I wrote. A book You're freezing up. Book called Out of the Dog. I'm sorry. I don't know if you're freezing up, up or I'm okay, freezing up. Good. One of us is freezing up. Well, maybe I should break out. It might be me. Oh, we're both freezing up. 
So, it was both of us. Okay. All right. Well, I left. And I see your, but yes, that's all good. So, okay. All right. Uh, do we still have participants? We yes, do. we're good. So, yes. Okay. So, so the question, I'm sorry, the question was, um, so I, let me just say, I wrote a book called Out of the Doghouse to try to help men understand how to heal betrayal when they betrayed a spouse. And trust me, I don't care how good the therapy is or how compassionate your husband is, men do not understand how to heal betrayal in women they have betrayed through infidelity. We just don't get it. I've done this for 30 years. It's why I wrote this stupid book because men think that, well, I've done disclosure, so now everything should be fine, or I've done an apology, and, and they know it's not quite right, but oftentimes they have no idea how to make it right, and they feel that they've done enough, or you should be over it, or whatever all of that is. So, um, I, you know, buy the book, don't buy the book, but in my experience, <clears throat> men need guidance about how to find a place of humility and healing with a partner that they've harmed, a female that they've harmed. Um, so that's just one little piece. Um, I have to say, you know, I really want you guys to know we volunteer every week and we're not here to rope anyone into treatment. But when I heard your story, I thought, well, that's a guy who needs to be in our treatment center. <laughs> because, and Tammy obviously had the same response, because it sounds like someone who's in a lot of denial and kind of invested, but kind of not, kind of like going through the, the work, but not really emotionally invested. And maybe there's something that he's really struggling with that's keeping him from having clarity or... You know, one thing, I, I sat with the guys in treatment today, and I can tell you the one thing that they are very clear on, <laughs> on many levels, is why they're in treatment, what they're supposed to do to get better, and why, and what it means to them. Because if I don't have their buy-in, as Tammy said, you know, it, I can't get them to work because I wave my magic wand. People have to want to get better. But maybe your husband doesn't know how. Maybe he follows his feelings instead of actions. It's always better to follow actions in early recovery than feelings. Um, you know, do this, do that. This is good. This is bad. Maybe he doesn't know how to or what the actions are. And maybe he doesn't know how to wake up to his emotional life. And he just feels, I think, as many addicts do, like, okay, well, I've just got to kind of not feel, not do, not get emotional, kind of shut down in order to not act out. But that means also not being emotionally available to you. So I think it's a very confusing process, especially for men, because we're not particularly emotionally available sometimes anyway. So to be able to figure out how to heal things with you, how to re-engage a relationship, how to value the relationship, how to prove that we really mean what we say. And I'm, I'm hedging all this because it sounds like you really feel like there is something there and he is working, but you don't think he's kind of like not getting it. And I think that is what treatment is for, is for somebody who's kind of struggling, they want to get it there. It's like what Tammy said, I, I don't need someone to be completely motivated to get well when they show up my door. I just need them to be curious. And if they're willing to be curious, I can lay it out for them. And by, then, by the way, and I will say this about treatment too, Tammy didn't mention it, but we're also able to say to that person and to you, you know, I don't think this person actually really does want to be with you. Or maybe they really don't want to grow this relationship, or maybe they really don't know how. You know, or maybe this man is having an affair with someone else and he's just biding his time with you. I don't know and you don't know. But what treatment does or the kind of intensive work it sounds like he needs is to break some of that open. And whether that means he goes to therapy more often and goes to more meetings or, but it sounds like there's something that he isn't getting and you're fairly able to detach and observe, which I admire you for. And you're saying, I don't really see the progress here with him as a person. Um, I think there's a lot more pieces you guys can put together with more therapy, more education, and perhaps a higher level of care. Yeah, and, and you wrote a lot, and I had lots of thoughts. But you know, a couple other things that I thought of um, were, first of all, like the disclosure process. You know, that that is really clear. You know, you drive separate cars. You do this. You know, you you know, it, it, it's a process and. Like, it sounds like it was kind of messy and there wasn't a whole lot of, um, you know, like there should be, wait, well, I, I'm going to take should because let's take those out. But in the ideally, training that you have had. Yes. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, in the training that I have had, my experience is that, you know, there's, there's a plan, you know, and you both have expectations of what it is. And it really is that it's going to be a foundation on which you could build you know, like there's going to be this level of honesty. And I'm curious about his, his therapist, because you're, if you're feeling like there isn't, um, there wasn't everything in it that needed to be, 
you know, I'm wondering about his preparation work for it. So, the, so those were a couple things. So, you know, it, it, yeah, an incomplete disclosure, we, we do hear about those. Um, so I'm curious about the process. I would really recommend also, I mean, just simple things to do. Any of the couples online stuff that we do, um, or any of the open things like I'm doing here, why don't you both come? Why don't you express these concerns in front of us? Let us respond. Let him type something in. I mean, this isn't therapy, but we can expand everybody's knowledge and everybody's ability to learn from the situation you're in. Um, and maybe he'll hear something that catches his ear. I don't know, but he's always welcome with you. And then the other thing that struck me was the staying active in couples ministry where we volunteer and not brought up the divorce or separation. And that speaks, you know, to a level of dishonesty. Um, yeah, that it's like, I want to have this facade mm -hmm. of that. I'm like, oh, we're, we're this happy couple and we're doing all of this when that's not the reality. And that to me is an aspect of addiction. When, when I'm able to compartmentalize and I'm going to be this person over here and then I'm going to be this other person over there. So, so it, the, the incongruency, you know, in his behavior and in his actions and in what he wants to, um, to share. And you also nailed it when you said he's numbing out on the couch. And you know, so I'm not acting out in my other sexual behavior, but I'm not doing recovery things. I'm just numbing out in a different way. And that speaks to addiction too. So I uh, agree with Dr. Rob would highly benefit from a higher level of care, whether it's much more involved with therapy, group therapy, et cetera. But, you know, obviously seeking integrity Los Angeles, I don't think there's a better program for dealing with these specific issues, you know, with the guys that come uh, to see us. So other thoughts before I go on? No, let's move on. Okay. All right. Is there a link between eroticized rage and one's sexual template? And you may need to elaborate on what eroticized rage and sexual template is, please. Um, so I wrote a blog, I've written a blog about this called, um, kind of understanding eroticized rage. What is eroticized rage? And, um, it, it, there are different ways that you can talk about this. For example, there are people who've had physical abuse in childhood and they've learned to sexualize that and it's become part of their sexual arousal template, as you put it. So they enjoy BDSM, they enjoy a little slap and tickle or some whip and some chains. And just because that came out of early trauma, once it's sexualized and the adult person still enjoys it, it isn't necessarily trauma repetition or anything if they do that, but you could say it's a form of eroticized rage. It's certainly the expression of the painful situation they experienced through sex, but now they enjoy it because they're an adult and they choose to engage in it. And so BDSM is, can be, could be considered by some to be eroticized rage. Um, I think of more eroticized rage when, like a rapist, for example, like I am so angry at women that I want to have sex with them and hurt them with sex. To me, rape is the ultimate form of eroticized rage. Another form might be me too, where I control a man or a woman because I sexualize them and I objectify them and I have power over them like the Weinstein person. That's a lot of rage and a lot of abusive behavior. Um, you could say in some ways that eroticized rage is sex addiction in the sense that people who respond to their anger by sexualizing it. So when I get in a fight with someone and I want to have sex with people, I, I have an argument with my boss and I want to go look at porn. I, in other words, when I experience anger, I want to go be sexual. Um, that could, you could say that the sexual expression of that anger is eroticized rage. But beyond the general descriptions and what I wrote in the blog, you can, by the way, if you want my blogs, my name, Rob Weiss, W-E-I-S-S, -S, Psychology Today, you'll find not just one blogs, but eight, eight years of writing about sex and infidelity, infidelity and porn and affairs. And I've been doing this a long time. And part of what we give away here is all the written stuff. Please find the blogs and Sex, Love and Addiction, the podcast. We're giving away as much as we can. You will find some answers to these questions in the blog. But I think for someone who's a spouse, let's say, or even an addict, who's asking me about eroticized rage, I would need to know how that, what they were thinking about. Like, so to answer that question here, I'd have to hear something like, you know, when we have sex, my wife likes to do this. And I wonder, it feels to me like anger, but she says she's just turned on. What does it mean? Like I, if I got something more specific, I could probably answer that because the, the concept of eroticized rage is broad and there are many definitions 
some would question whether it even exists. So, um, you know, it's one of those psychology things. Uh, it can mean many things. I'm going to skip a question because this one kind of tags into what you were just talking about. Is there a safe way to explore BDSM in recovery? I tried recently and could not keep my boundaries and acted out over a three month period. Well, this is a complicated question because I don't know you. And so how you live out your healthy sexuality and recovery is far better determined by your therapist and your sponsor and the people who know you well. Um, but in a general way, um, here's the reality. Look, I'm, I'm a gay guy. I like to have sex with men. I had sex with tons of men when I was single and acting out, but, but sober and married, not so much. Um, but I still have sex with men, a man in particular, the one I'm married to. So I, what turns me on, which is my orientation to men has not changed because I stopped acting out of my addiction. I'm still interested in men. Um, if I was heterosexual, I would still be interested in women. That's kind of what an arousal template is. If something probably turned you on, whether you acted it out or not, when you did act it out, and now that you're done acting out, it probably will still be interesting and attractive to you. <clears throat> what I would question is, how did you end up acting out again? How, what made that be a trigger for that? Was it, because I would never play BDSM in secret, behind someone's back, lying to a spouse, in an addictive way at all. You don't have to be out in the open. My sponsor would have to know about it. I would talk about it before and after, like those are the things that would tell me. So, but your question to me is not that different than some people who will say, okay, I've been sober for four months, I haven't had any sex and I wanna start masturbating again. Do you think that's gonna be a problem? For some people it really will. It will send them spinning into addiction. For other people, it's no big deal. They're not using the porn anymore and masturbation is just kind of self-care once a week. I, I don't know what it is for you, but I do know that absolutely yes, people can in their intimate lives bring play and sexual play and all forms of sexual arousal in provided they're not acting it out in a way that's secret without integrity in other words if i was involved with a partner and we agreed that we were going to tie each other up and do xyz and that's what we were going to do and we had a safe word and we had an agreement and then i don't see any problem with it if however i have an agenda that i'm going to push my partner a little further and not tell them because that's really turns me on not okay that's acting out you know so you have to take the same level of integrity and honesty and commitment into your sexual behaviors you do every other part of your life and if you live it that way and then talk about it openly with recovering people you shouldn't end up down the road of addiction thank you okay so the next question is could you please explain the results of the sdi which is the sexual dependency inventory test of ident identifies and is it important for essays to take um, it's kind of a long question. So not everyone is trained to use this instrument. Um, psychologists generally are trained to use psychological testing instruments. Dr. Patrick Carnes created a psychological testing instrument that he extended the use of to master's level people who took his training. So the good news is, I think, if someone is trained by Dr. Carnes and they're a CSAT and they have all the rights and responsibilities of that, then they will really, I think, make very good use of that in ways that those of us who had that training, myself included, understand how to interpret the document, how to read it, what it means, because there's a lot of training in how to work with it. So for those of us who are trained, I think it's a great instrument. In fact, speaking, this will speak to my age, there was a time when there were no computers and we used to had hand clients 250 question questionnaires that they have to answer and then we have to score them by hand. So I found that incredibly useful as a therapist to have to really in depth understand how someone viewed all these questions and well, it's easier now. Now we have a computer that groups the questions into answers and it clumps them and it gives us some answers. Okay, that's progress. Um, however, and it's useful, but if someone's not been trained in the use of it or they're just handed it or they're asking them to try something they don't know about, then I wouldn't trust them or it because they're not trained to understand the use of it or how it means. And they might skew or misinterpret things that we would understand better how to work with. I do absolutely believe that with a, a really good and thorough sexual inventory, um, really good therapy can be done without that particular instrument or any particular instrument. But the therapist has to be comfortable and trained to ask extensive questions about human sexuality, how much, how often, when, 
and in ways that most therapists are not. So what that instrument did, what the reason I think Dr. Kearns created it, was so that any good therapist could get a read, someone who didn't understand, how, look, I worked in residential treatment with Patrick Carnes for four years when he was developing these instruments. I mean, I learned to read them uh, back and forth and different. I mean, I was there at the beginning, so I can read them cold and I already know what they all behind them all. And I know what the questions are and I don't need the instrument to be honest with you, but there aren't that many people who have that level of training. And for someone who just knows a little bit about sex and a little bit more about addiction and they want to understand your addiction, it gives them a great explanation. Um, so it really, yes, it is a useful instrument. It doesn't, it can replace an extensive inventory or assessment or evaluation that a different therapist might do. And what I'll say finally is without a high level of assessment and clarity about your sexual history and behavior, it's harder for the person to help you. And so whether they get to that clarity through the instrument that Dr. Carnes created or through extensive interview and assessment, doesn't matter to me as long as they understand you and your behavior. Great. And tell me you're doing a lot of head nodding. I am. You guys can't <laughs> see, but I'm in their head. Because well, that's yeah, why I know I you said in a lot of training. So I did. And, you know, and I love that instrument. And I think it's one of those things where I think, you know, I do understand that it was handwritten before, but I think the just the process of what my experience is that clients, as they're just answering questions, it, you know, you kind of get into this rhythm of that. And, you know, there's even a, a dishonesty scale on there. So I think it really does help the therapist have, I, well, it's true. Um, but they, they, they aren't going to know how to, what, it doesn't matter. But uh, you know, I, if you're looking for help, it's one of those things where or it can really be a useful tool for the clinician to have. So they have a, you know, a baseline, there's still more digging to do. Um, but you know, it's just, a, it's the beginning of the process for the clients that are at Seeking Integrity. And then the clinical team takes all that information and keeps going with it. So and that's a great example, Tammy. Like, I, I don't use them personally because I pretty much could answer, I would know what the issues were, but my staff who are trained and they've worked in the, a number of years, but I don't want them to miss anything. And that report will note even the smallest dot of a behavior. Right. But again, <clears throat> like you said, in, in hands that haven't been trained, you know, then it's not like only wives, effective. Husbands. Well, yeah, like I think it's horrible if a therapist gives uh, the report to the to the client and whoever. I mean, like it's information that you don't really understand. It can be you know traumatizing and whatever. So so done right, it's great. Done wrong, it's problematic. Okay, next question. We are very early in the whole process after infidelity has been found out. She is in the fog and does not know what she wants, but has begun opening up communication to some degree and has not filed anything that I am aware of. I was asked to move out immediately and started my own therapy, and I know there are things that need to be done and need to be worked on. Right out of the doghouse twice, good now, and I'm doing my work, um, but, um, but her and I have not talked really about infidelity or addiction, just general feelings of what is happening. I don't know how to begin any such healing process, nor do I know the answer to the question of how do I know if I really suffer from a case of sexual addiction or if I suffer from deeper trauma that led me to start overt sexual behavior as an escape coping method versus drinking or drugs. Okay, I have to stop here. That is sex addiction. I was just going to say that that's the definition. So, so do you want to explain what you just read and why we're commenting like that? Do you mind? Yes. Well, yeah. What I yeah, I say this all the time to people that are calling or emailing that the acting out is the symptom. It's the underlying issues, whether it's you know the the deeper trauma that you're talking about. You know whether it's neglect, abandonment, you know shame, wh however that came from. It's the I don't like the previous question where now he's laying on the couch watching TV to numb out. It's numbing out. It's still the escape from uncomfortable feelings, not knowing how to deal with life in general. So, so if you're reading out of the doghouse and identifying with that, you know it, it's uh, it, 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 there's a self test too, and I'll put this in the chat. There's a self test on on our website that you can go take and it will tell you, um, it, it's, ju it's just a screening test, it's just a self-assessment. This is a very basic one. To see if you give, might be a sex addict. Yes, you, it will give you some information. So that's my two cents on that, but you, so, do you want to address the next? Yeah, thing? I mean, I just think, um, I'm trying to think of a metaphor for you. You know, if, um, I just think it's very, it would be very hard for 
me to proceed as a spouse unless I really thought that you as the person with the problem had clarity and clarity not only in terms of what you what was wrong with you or what you thought happened but that you had a plan I think many spouses are looking are not looking to us the person who's acted out to say oh yeah I really screwed up I must have a problem I uh, that's really I don't know yeah I'm so sorry they want us to say I think I've identified a problem, I'm not sure. I'm reading these books, I'm going to this therapist, I've started going to these groups, and I'm gonna learn about it, and you know, I know we're separate, but could we start some counseling together? I mean, they, you need to have a plan. And if you don't know that you have a problem, then you should get your butt to a trained therapist, get to some 12 step meetings, and read some books, not just out of the doghouse, because that's all about apologizing to your wife. I would read some more basic books on sex and love addiction to see if you actually have the problem. And then go to some meetings, not just one or two 12-step meetings, but go to half a dozen to see if it feels right and if you identify. So I think there's a lot you can do. And if you're looking for a trained therapist, Tammy knows people in every city in the country and around the globe. We make referrals all the time. No, we don't get kickbacks for them. We refer to people that we respect, that we've known for 10 or 15 years, and we think are great. So if you're looking for someone to help guide you as to whether you have a problem or not, write Tammy at SeekingIntegrity.com and we'll send you a couple of therapists. It just sends your zip code. We'll send you some therapists in your area. But I do think it is on you to determine what's going on with you, what you think the plan is for healing, and then communicate that very clearly to your spouse. <clears throat> That's going to be more reassuring than both of you sitting in the mud together. You need to get up and start moving and hopefully in the right direction. I just put a bunch of things in the chat so uh, to everybody Thanks so you can me. see those. So, okay, so this one I'm really excited about. I have been, I've recently gotten an accountability partner actually too, yay for me, yes, yay. I have been talking with one of them every day. We have a good connection and can be honest with each other, which is great. So the question is, how can we use these phone calls to our best advantage? In other words, what should we be asking each other or talking about? Well, uh, I have a question, Tammy. Are they talking about like dating and relationship accountability or just general life? This, this particular person has struggled with porn addiction so, yeah. um, and isolation. So that's why I know, I know that, that that is the case for this particular person. So, um, so that's I, helpful. Yeah. Okay. So I think, you know, really, um, if I'm someone who struggles with not doing the dishes, and I've been known to struggle with that. Instead of leaving it to my spouse to say, how come you haven't done the dishes? The dishes aren't done. When are they going to be done? I might do something like call my friend Tammy and say, Tammy, you know how terrible I am at doing the dishes? I'm going to call you every night when dinner's over to check in with you that I've just finished dinner. And then you're going to remind me that I need to go do the dishes. In other words, left to my own devices, as silly as it seems, because I'm an adult, I might just not do the right thing. And so, but if I make an agreement to check in with someone else or be accountable so that I will do the right thing, then I'm more likely to do it. In our recovery world, we do things like, well, I mentioned earlier that for some people, masturbation does become okay again. How would you know if that was okay again? Well, one of the things I might say is, well, I think you need to be accountable to someone you're working with, like your sponsor. Um, before you masturbate, give them a call. Tell them what's going on. After you masturbate, talk to them about how you're doing. I'm not talking about anything exciting or sexual. I'm talking about checking in with them because if you are a compulsive masturbator, you probably don't always make the right decisions about when the best time to do that is. But someone who's outside of that situation to whom you're accountable about checking in. So look at your life. Are you an, someone who isolates and needs to get out more? Let's say you are, as Tammy might have suggested. Well, then maybe you need to commit to going to church this night and a choir group that night and joining this group, you know, and, and going to ceramics class on Tuesdays. And Wednesday's going to this 12-step meeting. You need to, because you are an isolator, let's say, you need to make, commit to yourself and other people that you will show up in these places. These people need to be expecting you there. And then you're accountable to show up even on nights when you just feel like you just want to flop in front of the TV and space out and disappear. You're accountable to those other people in those classes, in that group, in those environments. And because you're accountable to others, you have to show up. And that can mean show up for an action. Like I call Tammy when I'm done with dinner. She reminds me I have to do show up for my washing dishes action, or it can mean for a problem behavior, like, you know, I need to check in with someone before I decide to have sex. But having accountability to others 
is key to recovery because one of the challenges of being an addict is we live in our heads and we say, well, I can get away with that. I can do that. I can not do that. And we detach ourselves from reality. And then it becomes the people who we love who, gosh darn it, they're the ones who are reminding us, you know, you're supposed to help the kids. You're supposed to do, they're reminding us of things that we were always supposed to be accountable to, but we talked ourselves out of being accountable to because our addiction distracted us. Well, now we need people who we trust and rely on to guide us back into the rhythms and patterns of a healthy life. And I think it's a great space to, to, to have the, how I'm feeling about this. If, you know, if Rob called me and said, I don't want to do the dishes. I'm so mad at my spouse, da, 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 or I've worked really hard today or whatever, you know? And, you know, so, so then we have the opportunity to talk about that, you know, kind of vent and, you know, and then, and then he might go, Oh, wait, I love my husband, blah, 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 or, you know, I had a busy day, but I will feel good when I get the dishes done, you know? So, so it helps reframe some things. Um, I think just being willing to be real, you know, and, and own, you know, like, I know it's really vulnerable, but just to you know, say, I'm not feeling okay. I really want to do whatever it is, you know, um, uh, but to, to have that real and honest check-in, it, you know, is, is really important. It's how you so, have those um, connections. And, the, and I would say, Tammy, that an accountability partner in this program might look something like, you know, I haven't dated in seven years and I don't want to date now, but I really need to start. So I'm going to put up an online profile and I'm going to have a friend help me design that profile and, and pick out the nice things I want to say about myself. And then I'm going to have them help me sign up for this dating thing online that I really don't want to do because I know I'll never meet anyone. No one ever meets anyone good online. And I don't want to do it. But I'll, And then I'm going to make myself accountable that when I check on this site to see if anyone has called me or reached out to me, or I'm going to talk to this person. And I'm accountable to the things I really, who do I need? What do I need an accountability partner for? It's to hold my feet to the fire around things that I know are good for me, but I don't really feel like I will do them consistently. And so, or I know I can give up my own values and beliefs and spill into behaviors I shouldn't, but if I'm accountable to this person, I probably, they'll remind me of what's important to me and I won't. Um, ultimately, all of this is about having other people in our lives to help guide our decisions and support our lives, which is what healthy people do automatically. Addicts tend to avoid asking for help and reaching out. All of this accountability stuff is to encourage healthy support of, of your decision making. Because as an addict, you're probably used to making a lot of decisions on your own and then proving them to yourself that they were right. And that's a bad feedback loop. Yeah, Rob and I joke about first thought wrong, you know, I mean, we, and we've learned, you know, and, you know, most of the time I'm not in that space, but every now and then I'll go, oh, I probably need to slow that one down a bit and I, I need to check out my second or third thought. So, so having an accountability person, it, I, I am, I have been just astounded where if I am thinking I need to run this by someone, now I've been around long enough to go you knew that that wasn't going to be the best thing to do. And you're, you're looking for someone to go, no. So, so, uh, you know, that, that's some great, um, I think, feedback from Dr. Rob about that. So hopefully that helps, but I'm really, really so thrilled. Good question. Now. Yeah. Okay. So this one's okay. It's the woman who's been dating. I went on date number five today and tried to ask some meaningful questions about what he is looking for in a partner and what are some of the deal breakers. He kind of evaded the question and talked about people's capacity to change and ended up questioning me about whether I'd go out with men with various kinds of histories, for example, sexual assault violence. I said <sighs> no and no to those examples. Then he dropped me off and I couldn't ask follow-up questions. Now I want to run a dang background check on him. How should I go about doing this? You know, Tammy, I think this is a woman's question to a woman, honestly, because she's asking about safety. I mean, what would you say to her? If you were out dating now as a sober person who's fairly stable in, in mind and heart, what would you do in a situation had this come up in this way? I, like it's so tempting to run the background check. I, I think I would ask him straight out and just say, I really need to explore more of this. You know, I want to understand and I don't want to make any assumptions. So to me, it would need a conversation and I understand he dropped you off and I guess it would be real telling if he, you know, doesn't answer the phone or whatever. But, but I think just say, you know, it was unsettling and I don't want stuff going on in my head. You know, I would like to know, you know, I would like to know for real. And before I just, 
concern. If something really is a deal breaker, I would want to know, you know, all, all the nuances for it. That's where I think I would go. What about you? I wouldn't, I would write it. I wouldn't go see the person because you might, you know, you don't know enough about this person. And now that they've dropped this information, um, look, I, I don't know why this is coming up, but I'll just, I went to a group once. I went to a group like training okay. and I was feeling really terrible about myself. And I said to someone something like, oh, I must be a sociopath. Well, before I knew it, half the room was like, oh, Rob's a sociopath. <laughs> I wasn't, I'm not. Um, I think that you just have to be careful how you how those judgments and how you throw that stuff around. And on the other hand, if someone gives you information, I would pay attention. And I would not necessarily meet with this person. And I would probably write, and I agree with Tammy, very clearly and invulnerably, I'm so glad you told me that you asked me that question. But it's unusual and it made me feel afraid, uncomfortable, whatever. I like you. I don't like you. I'm interested in seeing you again. I'm not. And if I am, I would need to know a lot more about that. And I'm not sure I want to meet again until you answer that because that's a bit of a scary comment. So can you be more detailed? And, you know, if they say, yes, I went to prison for rape five years ago and, you know, but I'm not a rapist, you know, I don't know. You guess you decide. Um, I don't, I cannot tell you what is right for you. Um, I can tell you that most sex offenders don't bring up the fact that they're offenders with people um, and, and, and defend them. So the fact that someone's willing to bring that up tells me that in some way they want to move something forward or they wouldn't be that open. And I do know, by the way, that sometimes people who are afraid of being rejected will throw out the worst thing in the world. Like, um, you know, I'm on my third date. Listen, just so you know, I'm a, I, when I was a drunk, I was a fallout, sleep on the ground. Anybody could have me drunk. And you're like, I didn't want to know that on the third date. Some people will do that just to just make sure they don't get rejected. They'll throw out the worst thing possible. So I think you don't have enough information, but I would be cautious about how you gathered the information. I'm not sure I would necessarily meet with them again or let them have a house key <laughs> until I have more information. Absolutely. Be safe. But to, to me, I know the stuff I can make up in my head is you know, could go way to the extreme and it could be something far more benign. So, so I would definitely in, ask for clarity and I think writing it out is a great idea. I also think, by the way, we do live in the 21st century. I'd not say, I'm sure I'd run a background check, but I would absolutely Google this person sure. and see, and I would go two or three pages deep because sometimes the first stuff that comes up is just very recent and see if there's anything of concern. I, I think that's anybody who's going out physical contact with another human being should probably know a little bit about them before they go out. Why not? You can. Okay, so I'm gonna, there's a question over in the chat. When is it appropriate to start working on trauma work and recovery? Do you slowly integrate it into your therapy sessions or wait for a certain period of time and then delve into it full force? So I wanna ask you this question, because I, you know, it's funny anytime this came up when I was doing that share at that 12 step group on Friday. Mm -hmm. Someone said, you know, when do I do trauma work? And so, you know, I got in and I answered the question, but what I thought about later was, well, what is trauma work? I mean, what do they think trauma work is? What does trauma work mean? Because, and I'll, uh, before I ask, I think some people think that trauma work is somehow detached from the rest of therapy. Like it's, you go off somewhere and you do trauma work or, or maybe only specialized therapists do trauma work. I mean, I don't know what that person's concept of trauma work is. I know what it means to me. Um, and I can answer the question in terms of what it means to me. So I can do that, but let me ask you, Tammy, what is, when someone says, oh, I wanna do some trauma work, what does that mean to you? To me, it sounds like they've identified things that they, I, that they perceive as traumatic and they want to work on not having um, the, the physical and emotional response to that particular thing. That's what I, but I've done, I, you know, I've had issues where I've gone and done EMDR and specific things. I mean, that's right. what it ended up being for me. I know our work is trauma informed, but I also- No, we do trauma, we do trauma work, trust me. Right, right, I, I agree. But, but, you know, when uh, my experience is also that often therapists want to delve right into the trauma until somebody right. has stability and addiction, all of that is just triggering and so then, so it's like so, finding the right balance. I think I can answer this question. Okay. Um, in a couple of different ways. I remember Tammy being in therapy years ago 
and I was working really hard. And I, this therapist said to me, you know, Rob, I have this feeling, I'm going to make a little more light here now the sun is going down. Um, the therapist said, I have this feeling, Rob, that in therapy, that you're looking for it. And you have this belief that when you find it or figure it out, that everything is going to change. And she was right. I was like, in my mind, and this is maybe three or four years into therapy, I was thinking, I'm going to find out my mom did this or my dad did this or that happened to me. And that means I'm going to grow a whole lot. But that's not really how it works. Um, we heal in little bits, bits and pieces and fits and starts. And sometimes trauma from a certain part of our life is the right time to work on it. And then other times not. And, and so for me, trauma work, what it means to me, first of all, recovery from addiction is trauma work. Because addiction is, the, is the ultimately a, uh, a, a maladaptive symptom of underlying trauma. People who don't have trauma don't struggle with intimacy, relationships, sexuality. They don't drink to make themselves feel better. They turn to friends. You know? <laughs> so um, there is a, an emotionally broken piece of every addict. But how we work that out and what that is, is different for every one of us. And this idea that you need to dig into trauma and get in there and kind of root it out and like, that's not really what we do. And I would not suggest any good therapy really does any of that. What we're looking for when I talk about trauma work is how does anything from your past interfere, how is anything in your past interfering with what you want today? You don't enjoy sex with your partner. You start fantasizing about other people or you blank out or porn runs through your head. Well, maybe that's a trauma response. You disappear and dissociate during sex. We could work on that. Maybe when people get angry at you, you kind of space out and disappear and don't know what to say and you get a little dissociative. We could work on that. That's a trauma symptom. Um, but the goal of, work, of doing trauma work is not to uncover and rip open and pour out a lot of acid and then we're all cleaned up. It's not like, it's not like lancing a boil. Trauma work is about learning what happened and then adapting in a healthier way and then kind of learning what happened or seeing the echoes of it. And it, it's all about adapting in healthier ways to the life you have. <clears throat> and when you can't, because something's in the way, in a really traumatic way, like you're having flashbacks or hallucinations, or we use certain methods like EMDR and different kinds of techniques, body somatic techniques, to help the person get past that really, really acute trauma symptom, which is like panic or spacing out or, you know, but beyond helping people get through the acute symptoms, trauma work is really much more long-term therapy coming to see what happened to you and how it's affected your life and slowly gaining better skills about how to negotiate the world that you're in. <clears throat> I don't think that I, a lot of us will ever know half the crap that happened to us. Many of us were too young. Addiction really forms, I think, somewhere two, three, four years old. None of us will really remember the trauma or drama, whether our mom was depressed or we don't know what happened to us. We may never understand how we react or why react in these strange ways when healthy people react in other healthier ways. But we can learn to act differently and find the health. And um, so let me just finish with this. I've often heard people say, you know, um, the term like they're going to heal their trauma. I don't think we ever heal our trauma. I think we learn to understand it, to come to terms with it, to accept it, and to um, grow beyond it. But just like a scar on your body when you've been harmed after it's healed, the trauma will always be with you. And that's part of why an addict always wants to act out because an early part of our brain just wants to run to something else when this kind of trauma symptom comes up. Um, I would worry less about getting into the trauma and <clears throat> be more focused about building healthy relationships, <clears throat> really binding and bonding yourself into recovery and learning how to have intimate love and sexuality, all of your trauma will come up in the process of trying to have a healthy life and you can deal with it step by step as it comes up. For me, and I've lived through this period in the therapy field in the 80s and 90s where we thought everything was about trauma. What I see people who delve into trauma and they're not building skill sets for a healthier life, they get less functional, not more. Tam, I have to close the door because it's getting chilly. Yes. Um, I'll be right back. Well, and I wanted to tag onto this because you mentioned um, 
uh, the like knowing and understanding things. And, and I remember there was somebody that was um, emailing and it was a partner and she, it was like, she was trying to figure out if she could just figure out all the, the reasons why he was struggling, then he could get fixed or whatever, you know? And, and I was like, head knowledge doesn't translate to, you know, like you could have all the head knowledge here of you know, like, even if you could somehow figure out everything, first of all, it'd be overwhelming. But second of all, that still doesn't, that isn't going to change how I react and how I behave, you know, so it, it's less useful. And I love what you said too, about the in layers and, you know, then keep working out. There was stuff I've been in, you know, I've been in recovery, you know, a few 24 sevens and um, like there was stuff just a couple years ago that I, like it was finally time to deal with it. Like I could not have in early recovery even identified it, let alone dealt with it. But, and it wasn't like this, oh my gosh, but it was just stuff that was niggling. And I was like, this is not serving me well. I have a fabulous therapist. I called her up and said, need to schedule some, you know, and went for a little while, did some EMDR, you know, and have not had um, the, the visceral reaction to that particular situation, you know, since that time. So, but do I think all my trauma is gone? No, I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple more years, I'm calling my therapist and going, got something else. And, you know, I mean, I'm, w I'm just willing to go through the process and deal with things as it comes up. So, all right, next question. Can you explain to me what the purpose of pathological narcissist on the planet? This is a serious question. I tried everything to be kind and loving, be firm, set boundaries, take distance, be cold, but nothing is working. Are they only here to destroy the people that they care for them? Um, well, I think this is the wrong question because the person who's asking it is still focusing or is so focused on the troubled person. Even if you're asking what is the purpose of them on the planet in the evolutionary scale, that's the wrong question. The question is why am I spending my time and focus trying to understand someone who cannot give anything back to me? I don't know anything about who asked this question or what their situation is, but I will say that this is the wrong question. Um, if someone is pathologically narcissistic and they don't choose to work on it, to come to terms with it and to be a better person, then I don't want to be around them. Um, and how I take care of myself and how I'm taking care of myself are the right questions, not how can I make them better. So I won't answer that one. Yeah, I, I'm with you. Okay, next question. Uh, Dr. Robin Tammy, I'm a female sex, love, and fantasy addict. Before I was aware of these addictions, I worked with a non-CSAT therapist for three years. She never mentioned sex, love, or fantasy addiction, but she suggested that my obsession and anxiety around my what would be qualifier were indicators of me being gay or bisexual. How do I discern my attraction to others as genuine romantic sexual attraction or my addiction acting out? I have little experience with dating relationships and my sexual addiction is mostly use of porn and compulsive masturbation. My fantasies involve people of all genders, despite being in recovery community with a CSAT, group therapy and 12 step meetings, I still feel just as confused about my sexuality as I did before I started recovery. I guess you're gonna to have to go on some dates. I mean, I don't think you're gonna be able to figure out what health and healthy dating and healthy attraction is until you're out there doing it. You may have to date some men, you have to date some women, you may have to date some transgender people. Remembering what a date is, going to an ugly, brightly lit coffee shop to get to know someone in separate cars, um, not to have sex. And, you know, I mean, in a way, if we could just take gender and orientation out of it, because people are to some degree people, and I'll be just like a millennial now. I'll give a millennial answer. People are people, I don't care what their gender is or what they're into, and maybe, and, and I know, that you need to date a lot of people before you really know who you enjoy, what you enjoy in another person. So maybe these are not questions that will be answered in the abstract. Maybe you have to go out and live your life and learn what you can live with, what you can tolerate, what you enjoy, and all of those things. I don't think that anyone can answer those things except you. And then I don't think there's any other way of going to answer them than figuring it out. And I don't think there's any way to figure it out, but trying. So um, come back after you've had some dates and bring us some feedback. Yes, we actually do love those stories. And, you know, at, Dr. Rob has talked before with dating, have a posse, make sure you're talking to them, you know, before and after. So ha have a plan, but, you know, I hope. Use your recovery to date. If you didn't know how to, if you've always picked the wrong people, 
Don't think it's just because you're in a recovery, you're going to start picking the right people. Um, use your, the people, your sponsor, your people, your therapy group to help decide if you should date someone or keep dating them and all of that. <clears throat> Even if sex with me is different from my essay husband than sex <clears throat> with his many other former, not current women, isn't it still possible that he is sexualizing his feelings when he has sex with me? And isn't that a problem? <sighs> well, I, that sounds like an intellectual question about an emotional situation. I would say to you, if you were, I was working with you, when you are with your husband and you are making love, if you feel he's not with you, why don't you ask him? Why don't you stop and say, honey, I feel like you're a little distant. What's going on with you? Are you present now? Or It is not unusual for sex addicts to struggle with intimate sexuality. It's terrifying for us. Intimacy is terrifying for us, no less sex. It's so easy to have sex with strangers, so difficult to be lovingly sexual with our partners. And I know guys and women who fake it till they make it because they don't know any other way of getting aroused. So they do just kind of squint their eyes and think about their porn. And it may not be ideal for you. It may not be where they want to be, but they don't know what else to do. So you as a loving partner might take this person by the hand and say, where are you right now? Can we stop for a moment? I feel like you're distant. These are things that you can do in the process. But I will say this to you. I feel like you're looking to get inside someone else's head. And that's an intellectual exercise. I would ask you more, how do you feel when you're with your spouse and you're making love? And if you don't feel like this person is present, then stop, follow your feelings and say, I feel like we're not really together in this moment. What's going on? Because I think the guesswork, it's the same kind of guesswork that every betrayed spouse does, but this kind of guesswork can really F up your sex life. Um, and I think the only way to get it answered is to be real and in the moment and talk to the person you're worried about, which is your spouse. So the next question, can you speak more about the I'm one person over here and an, uh, another over there and how it relates in addiction, the dishonesty? So the incongruence that we were talking about a little bit ago? Well, um, I guess I'll put it this way, because since people were talking about narcissism, every addict who's active in addiction is narcissistic by definition. So when I am actively acting as an addict, it's what I want, when I want it, what I want, and when, and I will manipulate and seduce and make all kinds of situations um, uh, uh, to be able to get what I want. And so, and then I have to live with that and tolerate that. So I may be doing things like putting my sex life over here and saying, well, this is my sex life and this is what I do here. And whatever happens here, it doesn't affect my marriage, which is over there and another box. So who I am in the, with the affair partners and the sex workers, I'm going to be a different person with my partner. And cause I'm going to be Mr. Hot dude with the affair partners, but with my spouse, I'm going to be more Mr. Whiny husband. And then at work, I'm going to look like Mr. Cool guy around women when actually it's all about integrity, which is the name of our treatment program, right? I named our treatment program Seeking Integrity. And I don't know if Tammy knows this, but did you know the program I had at Life Healing Center years ago was called the Sexual Integrity Program? I did not remember that. This word has haunted me because the word integrity is what our healing is all about. Integrity is about bringing separate parts together in a whole. And when you are an addict, you are living one life over here and one life over there. You're telling lies to this person and hiding this from that person. And there's no integrity there. It's all disintegrated. You are disintegrated. To bring a person together where, like it or not, what you see is who they are and what they're doing is, you know, if you saw me, you know, hanging out in sex environments, hiring prostitutes, you probably say, gosh, that guy doesn't look like he has a lot of integrity. It carries through in that way when you see hypocrisy. So, you know, um, that's really the goal of, of long-term recovery is about bringing yourself into one person that you can tolerate or myself into one person that I can tolerate. And that's the person I present to the world. And I don't hide. I mean, everyone doesn't see everything. You may not see me in the shower. But if you heard I took a shower, you wouldn't be like, oh my God, I can't believe that Rob Weiss person takes a shower. Nothing would surprise you because I, I have integrity. I have nothing to hide. And if it's really, really private and really personal, I'm not hiding it from my spouse. I'm not hiding it from my therapist. I'm not, I, there, isn't, there aren't two of me anywhere. Um, it's just levels of me that you get to know about. Um, I think that's how I think about that question. Yeah, I think that's a, yes, the levels of me, because I don't share everything with everybody, but 
you know, basically what you see is what you get. And, you know, you're not like, though, to speaking to the other one, it was like, I'm going to have this facade with the couple's ministry because I want to look good and, right. you know, and doing this. But in, in reality, like, you know, couples ministry, because we're, we're ministering to other couples, but our marriage is falling apart. So that is incongruent. That is, that is two behaviors. That Out of integrity, no integrity. Exactly. So <clears throat> by the way, I wanted to say something. I'm glad you brought that up a second time, Tammy, because that really bothered me. Um, I had a spouse in treatment recently who said more or less that she'd been asked to go to so many company dinners with her husband where, you know, there's a big picture of the family in the background and she's supposed to be, and everyone says, oh, how do you have such a wonderful family life when your husband works so much or whatever she was supposed to do? And she hated herself for having to stand there event after event and be the happy spouse when she knew that her life wasn't like that and she knew what he was really doing. So I wanna to tell to any spouse who has stood behind your man or your woman living a lie that you don't have to do that anymore. And one of the gifts of this process is you never have to join someone else in their lies, not to protect them, not to make them look good, not to, you know, if you want to, that's on you, but it will never make you feel good. And no one, in my, no one who cares about me today would ask me to join them in a lie, especially one that makes them feel so personally hypocritical. And if I were you, my friend, I would, I would never do couples ministry with this man again, not because you aren't good at it, not because you two can't help people, but because you do not want to live a hypocrisy and a lie with this man in public in front of other people, because you know that it isn't true. And that's enough for you to say, I don't want to do this anymore, no matter what you think. <clears throat> so the next question is, I'm super sick, all caps, of hearing you have to want to get better. For many years I've asked, how do you want to do what you don't want to do? I know I need, should, better, et cetera, want to get over my addiction. No. You know, and to some no, extent no, no. I do, but honestly, it is so difficult and painful and feels so hopeless that it is very hard to want whatever that means to deal with the pain and frustration of recovery. And as an addict, of course, I enjoy acting out. It's the only time I feel okay when, I escape, and I'm, when I'm in the escape zone. So again, how do you want to do what you don't want to do? So. I don't think you can do what you don't want to do. And I don't think that you're done acting out. Um, because for me, and for the people that come to treatment, I think a lot of times, the pain of what they've run into, the wall that they've hit with their addiction is so huge. I'm gonna lose my family. I'm gonna lose my uh, all self-respect, standing in the community, whatever's important to you, you're gonna lose it. People who are in that situation and really understand they're gonna lose their spouse and children, they're not worried about what they want or don't want or feel. They are committed to changing their lives because they don't wanna have more losses. So if what you're doing is working for you, I think you should continue. No addict like a happy addict, I say. And when you're done with your addiction, because it's done with you and spit you out on the rocks and you're lying out there to dry and you don't see how you're gonna get through another day, then you're gonna seek recovery, not because you want to, but because it's the only option you have because all the other ones are dark or sad or lonely or empty. It seems to me like you have too many choices here. So I say, go have fun. Listen, if it still worked for me, I'd still be out there. If Tammy could still drink, she'd still be drinking. I'm sure she would. <clears throat> but in our addictions, we got to a point where we understood, at least I understood, that what I was doing was intolerable to me as a human being. It was intolerable to me to the people I cared about. It was intolerable to me about the people I was having sex with. I could no longer live with the person I had become or that I had to be in order to live that life. And so you seem like someone, with all due respect, who still feels pretty comfortable with yourself in your addiction. And I say, good on you. Go live it. Go forget the recovery stuff. What a pain in the butt. Who would want to do all this hard work unless you have to? Because I don't think recovery for any of us is really about want to. It ultimately becomes about, I have to live this way. And you're not there yet. So good Lord, go have fun with your addiction. You're in the wrong room my response well and my thought was you know the only time i feel i mean i remember that I, I actually remember being the only time i was okay was when i was in my acting out and i don't feel like that anymore so i think that's the difference is um and i, I addiction recovery is terrifying it's 
so scary. You wonder if it's going to work for you. And it's then like it's having also, your skin peeled off. Well, but then it's also just as scary to think about, you know, if it does work, then what? Because, you know, if the only time you feel okay is when you're acting out that like, what are you supposed to do? And that's what recovery taught me was what I'm supposed to do. And I don't feel that way anymore. I feel okay. Like all the time, even when I'm having a horrible day or bad moments or whatever, I still am, I, I know for me that I'm, I'm grateful that I'm not acting out. So, so I'm with Dr. Rob, you know, go act out until you kind of go, I'm really sick of being. And don't feel bad about right. it. Have and, a good time. Yeah, but yeah, <clears throat> if and when you get to the point where you go, I want to try something different, you know, recovery will be here for you. So. It is absolutely true without question that everyone who really gets this work <clears throat> gets it because they have gotten to a point where they just simply do not want to live the way they're living. And they really, no matter what, don't want to go back there. It just can't, uh, it doesn't, it was fun. It worked. Parts of it was fun, but where I ended up and where it was at the end and what it turned into, I just don't want to be that person. And, and maybe, maybe Tammy, and then we should end on this. This is where that really tricky word called faith, shows up that maybe you or someone who needs the faith as if tammy and i sitting here helping people being articulate and in our lives and alive and present and whatever you perceive it if you have some faith in us because we have been where you are and we made a decision that the way we were living was intolerable and step by step moment by moment now if you ask me would you rather act out I'll tell you most days of the week. Yep. That sounds like more fun because acting out is more fun than living your own life in the moment. Life is tough. Being an adult is difficult, but the long-term satisfaction, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And, and, and what Tammy said is right. If, if the only thing that really brings you happiness and peace and, and is, act, is acting out, then that's your life and you get to embrace it and accept it and live it. I just question if that's the life you want. Thank you very much, all. Thank I will be you. online next week, later in the week, on In the Rooms Friday night. Thank you, Tammy. And for those that we ran out of um, time, I apologize, but ask early next time. Or drop oh, us a note. This yeah. is Tammy at Seeking Integrity. I'm Rob at Seeking Integrity, and we hope you have a great evening. Thank Bye you. Bye for real. Thanks, Thanks for your Rob. time. Bye bye.